Waterman. I am the executive director here at the Firehouse Art Center. We are a small nonprofit art center located in the heart of downtown Longmont um, at 4th and Kaufman. And I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of introduction to these artist talks. Uh, these artist talks are really just chats with artists, curators, members of the creative community, and creative entrepreneurs with a focus on how to build community within the arts. Firehouse Artist Talks give the community a chance to ask questions and get to a deeper level with the art on the wall. We are taping this talk, and you can find it on our YouTube channel along with our past artist talks and presentations. Our next talk is scheduled uh, for February 19th with our artist in residence, Nancy Eastman, who's actually in the audience, and artists for our South Gallery show that is she that she is also curating in February. Um, I just wanted to start with a couple of updates for the Firehouse Art Center. We do have life drawing tonight. Um, it's a long pose, drawing pose. Um, so the last pose will be two hours long. And we also have our regular drawing class tomorrow. Um, we have yoga every Wednesday. We have poetry night the last Fridays of the month. Play with play the third Thursdays, I believe, of the month. Um, we are having some events coming up, including a performance by Empathy Theater and the Winter Walkabout with Longmont Downtown Development Authority, as well as Drink and Draw at, on January 27th. So these are events that people can come and attend, um, so please we hope to see you in the gallery soon. I just wanted to give a shout out to our sponsors, uh, Longmont Downtown Development Authority, the Longmont Creative District, Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, Longmont Community Foundation, the Community Foundation of Boulder, the Boulder County Arts Alliance, and to Colorado Creative Industries. We couldn't connect our community to creative and life-changing art experiences without your help. And if you would like to donate to support our programming and exhibit, please visit our website at firehousearts.org. Um, and lastly, in the spirit of healing, the Firehouse acknowledges and honors the Arapaho tribe the original people of the land upon which the firehouse sits. We also wish to acknowledge all other indigenous tribes and nations who call Colorado home. It is because of their hardships and sacrifices that we are able to be here sharing this art with you today. And the firehouse believes that we can only grow when we have better appreciation for the history, legacy, and contributions that these tribes have made, not just to this region, but to the nation. I'm so excited to be here today with artists Ron Crittell and Pat Robinson, artists from our show, The Language of Landscape and Memory. Um, so as far as bios, Ron Crittell grew up in Chicago and attended the Art Institute of Chicago for studio art courses in painting and drawing, and the University of Chicago for academic courses. After an unsatisfying two years stint teaching art and English in an area high school, he was motivated to move to Ann Arbor, where he earned an MFA in painting at the University of Michigan. He then taught in Detroit for three years at Mary Grove College and at the Society of Arts and Crafts Professional Art School. In 1966, he took a position at Ohio University, where he eventually became chair of painting, drawing, and foundations for many years. Nationally and internationally exhibited, exhibited it with over 39 solo exhibitions. He has been awarded three Ohio Art Council Fellowships, an Arts Midwest NEA Fellowship, and numerous prizes and awards. His work most recently appeared in the Book International Painting Annual One, published by Manifest Gallery, and has been acquired, his work has been acquired by eight museums nationally and has been added to many private collections. As a professor at Ohio University, he had the good fortune to teach in a considerable number, number of education abroad programs in London, Prague, and Florence, and these experiences profoundly influenced his teaching and his art practice. Most recently, he finished teaching in Ohio's university, university's London education abroad program starting in the summer of 2000. And Catherine Robinson is a Colorado-based book artist and landscape painter. She received a BFA in 2011 from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and continued her education at the American Academy of Bookbinding in Calgary. Catherine moved to Colorado to learn how to paint landscapes. Her paintings of landscapes inspired and continue to inform her book works today. Her work explores the various technologies humans have used to store knowledge throughout time. Pre-literate cultures used mnemonic devices, often landscapes and natural objects, 
to store knowledge, and increasingly, we now use smartphones and tablets. So Catherine's work suggests landscapes with her books, and her handmade boxes are architectural as well as that was a lot of information in bio. We're going to get into a little bit of more who these people are as artists. Um, and any works that we reference in this talk uh, in the YouTube video will actually be uh, showcased at the end. So when we talk about a work, you'll be able to see um, you know, the work up close and personal afterwards. So um, as we were putting together this show, um, you know, the title, we usually try and stick with titles that are a little bit shorter so you can think, oh, you know, we're going down to the firehouse to see the exhibit and you can say it without using too many words. But <laughs> this one kind of started out shorter and as it was put together, it turned into the language of landscape and memory, which is a very long title. But I wanted to kind of honor these artists' connection with language and the transference of knowledge, as well as how that connects with um, you know, the memory of the land that we were in. Um, and as far as the transfer of knowledge, I wanted to start with Kat first, because um, your primary um, medium that you work with is bookmaking, and books are obviously, um, you know, one of the primary tools for transferring knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so, as far as like your history of being a bookbinder, you mentioned you went to the Art Institute. Um, did you have experience there? Uh, you Getting started with bookbinding? Yeah. So, um, actually, the most popular class when I went to SAIC was bookbinding one. So, like almost everyone else in that school, I got my um, butt over to the printmaking department and took bookbinding. And I immediately really fell in love with it. Um, I think I've always had like a kind of a deep fascination with books. Uh, although, primarily when I was at the Art Institute, I was mostly doing large installation works. Uh, that's kind of hard to do when you live in a tiny apartment. So after school, I went back into bookbinding. And you know, I was never a writer or a printmaker, so the idea of a book and the form of the book was what was interesting to me, not so much like content, per se. Yeah, and you were talking about um, you know working with these big installations. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have to say, and we have talked about this before we started filming, like um, you always want people to see your books first. Like when you go apply for a show, you always want to be able to show your work. Because when I saw your books in the application, and even though we have a dimension, mm -hmm. um, I was still shocked when you brought them in by their small size. Like that was my my feeling, like I was like, oh my gosh, look, they're so tiny. Um, but I was so impressed with all the detail and the love that you put into that tiny package. Um, so what were the elements that kind of went into that decision to work in that scale? Yeah, so there's a couple of things I had to consider when I was making my work after school. I didn't have studio space, um, so I had to kind of work small to fit it to my apartment. And then when I began working with materials I work with now. So right now what I do is I take an old book, I take it apart and I rebind it. But in the process of doing that you actually have to make that next book like a quarter of the size of the original book. Just by the way you have to refold the papers. So they had to end up being smaller for me to work in this way. So you know it was too it was it was just sort of a natural kind of Thing that happened, but I do enjoy the size of them because when you hold them, you have to hold your hands close together, almost like a hug. Um, they make you get close to them, they make you pay attention, uh, and they make you want to interact with them. So I enjoy the size of there, and I'm going to experiment with bigger ones, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep that feeling. Yeah. Um, and then in your, uh, the bio that I read, um, and it really led to the whole language part of being in the show, you spoke about mnemonic devices mm -hmm. and pre-literate communication of knowledge. Um, tell me more about that, because that, that seems like you know, a really big thing to yeah. those, those, those words, and uh, you know, just extrapolate on, on what that means to you. Yeah, so it is a very, very dense topic, uh, but 
I'll try to parse it down as much as I can. If you find this interesting, I do highly recommend reading the book. <laughs> um, it's called The Memory Code by Lynn Kelly. And in it, uh, she talks about you know, non-literate cultures, and she's from Australia, and the Aboriginal are still, for the most part, non-literate, so they, they are an oral culture. They transfer all knowledge orally by speaking. So they can't write it down, so they have to memorize it. And the way that they memorize it is they use rituals in these sacred places within the landscape. And in repeating these rituals, they memorize the knowledge. And then to sort of organize it in their brain, they have different sites are different subheadings of knowledge. And when they want to remember something, they, in their minds, travel to that place, and it will kind of unlock all of the memory. And this is actually a very, and almost every culture on the street did it. Um, they call it a memory palace. And these days, people who count cards, they actually do it the exact same way. So while it's a less common way of holding knowledge now, it is still used by other people. Um, and it's a very rich way of doing it because what I realized is when I look at my landscape paintings that I made on site, I have the same experience. I can look at a landscape painting that I made and I can have all these memories that I don't think I would have otherwise. Well, about even the day where I was listening to it. So, um, it is a different way of storing knowledge from a book and it is in some ways richer. Um, and then asking you, Ron, um, so Kat was talking about being in a landscape and then kind of having those connections and those memories. I wanted to talk about, you had a 2018 retrospective, 50 uh, year journey of uh, all your paintings and it was um, marking your return to Athens. So marking your arrival at a place. Um, and then this series is the Glaze series. Does that serve as that for your move to Fort Collins? And do you feel like art helps you process being in a museum? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, the first exhibition you referred to, the retrospective, um, when I came to uh, Ohio University, which is a lot like Colorado State, except it's in Appalachia, it's in the Appalachian Hills uh, of Eastern Ohio, Southeastern Ohio. So it's really more a part of West Virginia than it is of the Midwest. <laughs> okay, and it's green and it's humid and there are huge trees everywhere and everything grows like mad and there's water everywhere. So uh, that subconsciously, I guess, influenced all the work I did. And uh, um, I had some work up at the University of Wyoming in their art museum. And uh, there was a discussion, something like this, and one of the students said that all the, all the work that, that came from Athens, from Ohio, was green in tint. <laughs> and it, even the figure paintings, they all had a kind of a greenish tinge. And I'm sure that just sort of subconsciously soaked into my, my body. So I came out here, uh, the journey continued, you might say, uh, trying to figure out where I am here. And here, the landscape, especially in most of the year, it's sort of a tan color, a brown color. It does get green in the spring, but even then, it's not rank like it is in Appalachia. So um, my, my pet, I spent a number of years just drawing and trying to figure out where I was, how to connect to it. And uh, these, these paintings are part of a series um, that uh, I helped me connect to where, where I am living now and helped me uh, dwell on it, you might say. Mm -hmm. In a physical and, in physical and uh, intellectual a way, you know, that they kind of combine, uh, and it, it gives it gives meaning to to the way the way I live. Um, and these these uh, pieces, as uh, you had in your statement, um, you were talking about the proposed NISP, the Northern Integrated Supply Project, Glade Reservoir near Fort Collins. Um, 
what what is that project? What does that entail, and, and how does that kind of affect? Uh, it, it's a it's a huge proposed reservoir. I don't know if any of you know about it because I don't think it's going to affect Longmont directly, <clears throat> but everything north of here will be affected. Um, that whole what Wells County. Anyway, it's uh, it's I forget how many square acre feet of water, but it's going to be 280 feet deep, and it's going to be slightly bigger than Horsetooth Reservoir, if you know where that is. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's like 10 miles long, Horsetooth. And this is going to be roughly the same size. And uh, this is the valley where uh, the reservoir is going to go. And uh, it's also a valley that's connected to the, uh, the, the Poudre River, the Cache the Poudre River. And that's an ancient, you talking about honoring the Arapaho who used to live on this land right here. Well, they were definitely in that valley. The whole river valley was uh, populated and hunted and uh, lived in by, by many Native Americans for a long time. And even, I would say, 150 years ago, this whole area was almost entirely controlled by Indians. The white people hadn't come in at all yet, so this is a relatively new area. Anyway, um, I did I did not feel. I mean, I love the high mountains, you know, the Steve Park and all that, and it, it's all beautiful. But it it was like a remote, sublime landscape that I loved to be in. But it didn't. It's not where I was living. I was living in the Front Range. Uh, I guess where we all live now. And uh, so I was looking for <clears throat> um, something, a subject matter that I could connect, that I could identify with, and not just uh, uh, think of as a beautiful, otherworldly mountain. And I, I found the Great Reservoir Valley that uh, is going to be transformed into a reservoir. And it, it just seemed like a perfect subject to connect um, cultural needs, societal needs, and um, the landscape, and what's really here. And my work is not a kind of a, uh, a political, what's the word? Uh, a statement? A statement, that's weak. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a a political statement, a diatribe, yeah, or whatever. I'm not trying to convince anybody uh, that um, a reservoir is a terrible thing, it's ruining the river, or I'm not trying to say that it's, it's absolutely essential for growth and for walk. I mean, there are really strong arguments on both sides, and, and my wife and I have uh, a brother-in-law who's the chair of the NISP. He's definitely been promoting this for 25 years. And we have other good friends who have been fighting it with lawsuits for 25 years. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not why I'm, I'm not making a political statement exactly. But, I mean, there are both good arguments. There are arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. And so this is um, something to reflect on and uh, maybe even help clarify your own thinking. That, mm -hmm. That's my right. point. Yeah, to create that space for dialogue, um, yes. but then also kind of document a landscape that's not that is going to be changed or might not be there. So yeah. there's that right. um, what you call uh, former pre-nostalgia that you're <laughs> creating yeah. with this this work, yeah. um, this land that might be under 280 feet of water. Of course, um, I, I'm dealing with a very specific spot in Colorado. Uh, that I can go to and walk in and breathe in and so forth. But that, that whole idea of um, how we use resources of nature is really a global issue. I mean, it's not only the oceans, but it's everything in the whole planet now. And uh, I, so I'm, I'm not trying to discuss those uh, issues in my work, but I think it does reflect that. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a connection. One thing leads to another. Mm -hmm. okay. So not 
So just describing the ethical consideration mm -hmm. uh, in that. Yeah. Um, and this was this was part that I kind of just found out recently about these works that you had um, been inspired by a film series uh, called Decalogue. So it was actually um, alluding to the Decalogue and in indirect reference to the Ten Commandments, obviously, which are um, you know a how to list of how to behave and. Um, so you took these drawings and kind of just talk about that because I know I don't I didn't really kind of get this information before, but you have these drawings that have elements that um, kind of reference back to the Ten Commandments. Uh, yes, we have we have a good friend who told us uh, about this Polish film series, um, and there are ten films, and they all reference. The Ten Commandments in, in, in a Polish high rise apartment building. And it's what goes on in there between people's actions. And it's when you watch this series, there's no obvious reference to any specific Ten Commandments. I mean, you can't say, well, that's about thou shalt not steal from the whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> thou shalt not steal. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing in any of them that particularly relates to that, mm -hmm. but it just was sort of a vague general reference to ethical considerations and the fact that there were 10 of them related to the Ten Commandments. And I, I really thought that was such a great idea that I stole. <laughs> and I, I did 10 drawings that are in an exhibit in the Fort Collins, the Gregory Alcar Museum, uh, the University Museum. It just, I, we, matter of fact, we just saw it yesterday. And so there are 10 drawings, and they, they just uh, generally relate to ethical considerations. And, and these are an extension of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I'm not trying to preach Judeo-Christian ethics per se. It's just a way of considering ethical issues. Um, as far as process, uh, you kind of spoke about it before going into the place and creating. Uh, I just wanted to bring in some of Megan's work and kind of, uh, we were talking about how do we put these artists together. Well, there just happened to be certain coincidences when we put these artists together, like, oh, you went to the Art Institute of Chicago. Oh, wait, you used to create these. So Megan actually creates these torn paper collages in her car. And obviously, so you can this piece behind us, it's very large, uh, but she brings these torn paper, already kind of pieces of some prepared, and goes to the place and looks out of the front uh, windshield of her car, and then she tears and puts these together. And she was talking about being in the place and creating and using the cut paper and the torn paper to create space and how you know she would be parked in her car and people would be passing and kind of giving her strange looks because they would be parked you know in front of their house and as i was talking to ron he said i used to do the same thing i had an art van where i would sit in the back of the art van and i would um, you know create these charcoal drawings and people would also kind of look at me strange um what Tell me something about that because I think that that is just so great. A lot of people, you know, kind of go and they do plein air work and they have some small sketchbooks and then you and Megan both are working in larger ones. Yeah. Well, these were all done from drawings uh, and sketches on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, some were actually done in my uh, car that I did, 2000 Subaru. Mm -hmm. um, sit in there with my sketchbook, a little sketchbook, and I, I make fairly detailed drawings. And then sometimes I get out, and I, like that one on the end, was actually drawn from uh, the roadside looking down on this little screen. Um, so uh, uh, that's been a part of my process. You know, I, I have done actual paintings out there, but uh, Normally, I just make sketches and then uh, elaborate them. Sometimes they're with paint, color. Is the art van still around? 
No, it 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 was traded in for another for our other car. <laughs> yeah, it it it, it conked out. I just yeah, you should you know tell a, a story or two about how you got in trouble and got hurt. Well, um, I not only drew uh, landscapes, but houses and also factories. And along the Ohio River, um, if anybody knows where Parkersburg is, the whole Ohio, that whole part of the Ohio River has a lot of just uh, refineries and factories. A big, they look like outer space, just refineries. And I pulled into uh, their parking you, there's a little road that leads up to these factories, and I stopped, and I was in there doing my thing, you know, and here comes a pickup truck racing down the road towards me, and the guy was armed. <laughs> and he, he asked what the heck I was doing, I said, well, I'm just a humble artist, you know, <laughs> and he, he thought that I was some sort of an environmentalist, I think, gathering information on their smoke or pollution or something, I don't know what, I wasn't, but that's what he was assuming. So uh, I had to get out of there, you know. And, I mean, it was a little tense, you know. So he didn't, pick, pick he didn't let you stay and drop? No, I don't know. So I kind of wonder if we should get little patches. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like. I'll, I was thinking of getting an AK-47. That way. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> And the same thing ha did happen to me drawing uh, in this valley. Mm -hmm. I pulled into a road off, off the uh, main highway and went back in there and was drawing some rocks. And I, I mean, it was private land, I guess. And some pickup truck stops and they had a gun in the back window. And they, yeah, what are you, you know. So I got out of there too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, but it, it, it actually is. It's fine. I mean, it's, it, it's part of the process of connecting to where you are. And if, if there's certain dangers involved, well, that's there too. So. Mm -hmm. um, so, Rob, your style has evolved and changed over the years, with earlier works combining figurative and surrealist landscape. Uh, how do you mesh experimenting with different styles while also trying to create a consistent creative voice? Uh, I don't know, I think there's probably something that looks like my work all along, but um, until, well, I'll try to make this very brief. As a, a student at the Art Institute, I was extremely naive. I had no previous art training, really. No formal training. And, but I like to do it. And uh, so, I spent my years at the Art Institute trying to figure out man, what's the difference between abstract and non-objective painting at that time. What what is what is Baroque? <laughs> I didn't know what Baroque art was, and yet alone Mesopotamian art. I had no sense of art history and no sense of contemporary art, and so I spent about 15 years altogether trying to figure out what I was ignorant of. And so I, at that point, I had gone through um, abstract expressionism and pop art and minimalism and installation and uh, uh, earth art and performance art. I went through all of it and I, uh, I finally felt that um, art had become life. That you could just cut the grass and that could be a form of aesthetic involvement, that art, what you do with your life can be art. I mean, Joseph Boyes is the one who was the most, probably famous influence for that. Um, and when that happened, I just, I just stopped and I sort of caught up with it all and um, um, had in, internalized it. And it, it, it just left me. And so I went back to art I and mean, to drawing and, and painting. And uh, so I did the figure, those figures that you referred to for 15 years. 
And uh, they sort of, I just sort of ran out of juice on them, you might say. And then I, I did a whole series of, uh, of drawings and little landscape works for another 15 years. And then the figure came back, and I combined them both. And I'm still at that point. So here, uh, since we moved here, um, uh, I have done some figure paintings, mm -hmm. uh, quite a few, but I've uh, recently just tried to figure out this landscape and where I'm at. So I don't know, it's just, it, it's not so much trying to develop a style as trying to, to understand uh, your life and how you fit in and what what's going on around you in the world. And uh, that tends to metamorphosis into different involvements. And, uh, so it's really it's really in about an inquiry or a, 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 a journey of inquiry rather than trying to develop a singular style. Okay. Um, and then Kat, so your work obviously has such a, divine, a defined process, and then I'll, you know, as Tom was talking about, like this inquiry. Um, how do you bring that inquiry into your work and that experimentation in your work when it's so tied with mm -hmm. you know, the steps? Yeah, um, I guess I'd love to give the steps on how I make my work. So, uh, like I said, I use old books, I take them apart, I refold the papers, I bind the book. Um, and because I don't have to consider really how big the book is because there isn't content in that form in it, I just go until it feels right. And then I find an object, I have a large collection of rocks and stuff to go with it. And then I um, work on the box. So I guess the book form hasn't changed much in so long. I just think, um, you know, I'm trying to, now I'm going back and I'm wondering if I should rethink the books, but that to me has now become static in a way. The box form, I started making boxes for the works in 2020. Um, so I've been experimenting a lot with the boxes. They're sort of traditional, but they always have some kind of twist that I put on them, especially the ones more recently. They'll have these angular cutouts. Um, they'll use multiple layers of boxes, and that's how they slide into each other. And I like the angular form, A, because I think it works well with the materials, but B, they sometimes sort of can reference like a mountain. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's where I've been experimenting with the most. It's a lot of sort of prototyping, you know, trying new things, but using similar shapes and forms. So that's where the most most of my experimentation in the past few years has been in the last. And um, you know, obviously this is a, a landscape show. Mm -hmm. Your title of your series is Strata. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that refers to the, I guess the outside, the torn, deviled edges of the, yes. the books and, then, and how it's dyed and it looks like the strata of land. Yes. Um, are there other additional meanings uh, to that title? Or? Yeah, I mean, I like the idea of layers, layers of metaphor, layers of history, layers of stories, um, as well as like, obviously what strata means. You know, I, I really started getting into this work when I moved to Colorado 10 years ago, and I wanted to learn how to paint landscape. That's why I moved here. So I was constantly driving up and down I-70 and looking at the strata layers in Morrison, and I was like, ah, this is amazing. Um, so, and then seeing them in person, I was like, you know, that kind of looks like torn paper. And since I never really know, I never really knew what to put in my books, I just liked making them. I decided to start painting the edges of my books and seeing how it looks. So I paint them with gouache paint, which I also, which first of all, I use gouache paint to paint landscapes, but also gouache painting the edges of your books is a very traditional book binding technique or four edge painting, although that would never be done on four edges. So it, it, it just sort of naturally made sense and, and happened. Um, it was later that I learned more about the landscape mnemonic devices for storing knowledge, and that added another layer uh, to the <laughs> metaphor. And so, you know, they just keep layering on. Yeah. Um, so sometimes people, so we, we've displayed these books in different ways. So you can kind of see, some of them you see the 
outside edges. And mm -hmm. you were talking about the strata and the layers. Some of them you focus on the closed boxes and how it has like uh, an architectural look to it. Um, how do you pair the books to the boxes, to the fossils and the rock? Like, do you know going in? Do you pair them based on what's inside them? I don't know going in. I make the book mm -hmm. and then I go to the boxes object. And it's, it's an intuitive process of holding them and seeing like, is it the same width as this? And then how would I put these together in a box? Because sometimes the box integrates the object into the box and the box has the object in it and it doesn't come out. And sometimes the object you can take out of the box along with the book. So um, it's just kind of an intuitive experimental process and I guess so I couldn't really kind of know rhyme or reason. I'm just having that for I experience because I can't experiment with so many other parts of it because it is a very like static kind of mm -hmm. process. Uh, so that's where I get to have fun. Awesome. And um, you know, people that come to view the exhibit, they can actually touch the yes. pieces. <laughs> so um, on the opening night, Cabot here, and you know, people could kind of just walk around and tour and touch. And when the gallery's open and she's not here, we have gloves. Um, you know, we were kind of struggling. Do we let people touch? Do we not? Do we kind of, because you can't really, you know. So, um, but then you stress to me that you feel like it's something that needs to be touched. And why is that? Um, I think there's like, people tend to have a really sort of emotional reaction when they're able to touch the books. Uh, and I, I want people to have that. You know, like a lot, you know, when I was talking about the mnemonic devices and the, the rituals and the landscape and all that, um, a, a lot of the times, like, it, it's also a spiritual experience. And whether or not for the person doing the, the ritual, if they think of it as being spiritual or not, it's so important that they either said it was spiritual or it felt spiritual to them. So having a, a preciousness and spiritualness with the words, I think, is really, really important. And I think, because a large part of what I'm trying to convey is like, you know, I think a lot of times we're like, oh, it's a mountain, whatever, blow it up, we need the gold. And we don't have any consideration for what the landscape meant for the people who lived here before us, mm -hmm. um, possibly because we're not as connected to it, but I think also just because we use written language, we have lost touch with this other way of um, holding knowledge and the importance and the sacredness of it. So I want to reconnect you to the sacredness of the land and like foster a kind of respect for the people who lived here before you and how they feel, you know, when we blow up Mount Rushmore. Um, yeah, which was pretty messed up. So yeah, I do have something to say with that, but I want you to I want you to be more curious and to feel emotional when you're. And I don't think you get it if you don't handle the books. Yeah, that's hacked out. Yeah, definitely. Um, and going back to uh, kind of like the commonalities, I know you teach, and obviously you um, have spent many years teaching. Um, so teaching seems to be a very important life part of both your creative life. Uh, when did you decide that you wanted to share your knowledge? And I guess I'll just leave it with that. When did you decide? <laughs> <laughs> and you can both answer. Um, well, I, uh, I thought that I would uh, uh, go to the Art Institute and become an artist, and then that's what I would do. I would be an artist and I would be able to live, maybe very humbly, but I thought I would be able to live. Well, that wasn't true, so <laughs> I, uh, I decided that since I can't sell my work for big bucks, uh, I'll have to get a teaching degree. So I did. I taught at a high school for two years. The high school that Hillary Clinton went to, by the way. Although, uh, oh, there was there's some interesting, funny stories there, but I'll let that go. And I, after teaching, it, I taught art and English because at the University of Chicago, I got a humanities degree. And this high school said, oh, uh, we need somebody in art, we need somebody in English, we'll let this guy do both. It was 
tremendously hard work, tremendously demanding, especially since I didn't know how to teach junior English. I didn't even know who Natty Bumpo was. So I had to do all that research like a day ahead of my classes. So um, I just, and I also I didn't have any time to do art. So I decided to go to the University of Michigan where I would get uh, a graduate degree and then I'd be able to teach college where you'd be able to teach and still do your own art. And um, the teaching part was uh, a challenge and it was interesting, but it wasn't, uh, I didn't have any great desire to impart truth to students. I just, I just survived. But then when I, when I taught at Ohio University, I, I developed a, a system of teaching and a way of approaching teaching that was also very important to me personally. And so I was able to uh, learn and grow because I was teaching. And the students all had interesting ideas and challenges and uh, would make me reconsider even the foundation of my teaching at one point. And uh, so it, the, the teaching, um, the, in, the, the idea of being, of inquiring as a student and as a teacher, uh, it, it really helped me over the years. And I, I miss it. Mm -hmm. I don't miss the committees. <laughs> but I, I miss the contact with students. Yeah. Well, I I don't have a master's and I'm not a huge like university level teacher, but I do enjoy teaching Ooh. I do enjoy teaching a, a workshop. Like like I said, like the bookbinding class in my school when I went there was the most popular class in school. Um, so there's definitely a lot of people that are really, really interested in learning how to make a book, um, make their own sketchbooks, make books that, you know, for their portfolios. So I think there's a pretty big need. And a lot of the times, a lot of the programs are really quite expensive. Like, um, the American Academy of Bookbinding and Poetry is fantastic. Um, they do have a scholarship program, by the way. Um, highly recommend Y'all looking into that if you want to learn really, really fine binding. But, um, you know, the classes are like $1,000 plus. And then you have to pay Kelly Wright, which is another $1,000. So um, my goal has always been to teach entry-level classes that are accessible for people who don't want to have tons of equipment. Uh, you know, my book binding equipment for the binding that I do, I did, I counted eight moves and one international and back and I can take all my binding supplies with me. Which, if you learn from somewhere else, they have equipment that literally weighs a ton. So I, I like to teach accessible classes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that small scale learning is, you yeah. know, there's no judging the importance of that. I feel like imparting your knowledge and sharing a skill, like book binding, as you were saying before, like, you're, we're losing that connection with that reliance on smartphones and, and other kind of electronic technology um, that we're losing that connection. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that we're losing because of these, you know, kind of um, new developments that are, that are tools that help us, but like we're losing a lot of that connection to the, the things that we can create. Um, so I think it's really important to keep sharing those skills as well. Um, so, and speaking of teaching, I just wanted to check the time, but this is, I don't want to run out because I know that you guys have questions, but uh, this will be on my, kind of like my last question, but I don't know if that's actually true. <laughs> and speaking of teaching, um, do you either, if you have a mentor that helped you expand your practice or help, become, help you become the artist that you are? I mean, my first book finding teacher, uh, Myung Ha, was like hugely influential to me. You know, she really encouraged me. She actually made the class book binding too um, for me. <laughs> so she invented a whole new class in the school uh, for me and my friends because we were so upset. So, uh, you know, and when I go back, I went back to my school because there is a large artist book collection at the Art Institute. Um, and it went back to donate a piece. And as soon as the curator saw it, she was like, 
you were one of the unknown students, weren't you? Um, <laughs> she knew because she was like, it's perfect. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as I said earlier, the, the, uh, the teachers at the Art Institute um, really didn't do anything. They just let you work. And yeah. uh, once in a while, they'd, they'd say something. But uh, I think it was a very European attitude at the time. Um, I think nowadays in universities, uh, teachers really say a lot and give a lot. But they, they didn't. My, my just a, a short answer is uh, my first music teacher was my mentor. When I was uh, a kid, I don't know, I guess I was maybe 13 when I... I had a teacher at nine years, a piano teacher, who would hit my hands with a ruler if I made a mistake. So that... that I went, had a pencil. That, was, that, that disappeared. She disappeared. Miss Rosine. And uh, then I had another teacher... Uh, who taught regular theory, but also jazz improvisation, and uh, uh, Mr. Schiller. And he, uh, he taught me all the fundamentals of, of music and of coming up with ideas, uh, not just reading music, although that was part of it, but also then how to take a song and make your own version of it, you know? And uh, all, even though I wasn't studying any art, that whole concept fed into basically everything. So he was, uh, um, we wouldn't only talk about music, but we would talk about ideas, and he was a real influence on me as a young kid. Uh, he, you know, he, for example, uh, this was at the time when Elvis Presley <laughs> was uh, coming on the scene, and I said, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of people really like Elvis Presley. They don't think they don't listen to Beethoven. And I had a friend who, you know, we would go listen to classical music, and, and I would make him listen to jazz, and he would make me listen to Beethoven. So that was great. And I asked my teacher about it, and he says, "Well, he says, you know, Elvis Presley serves a real important social function. Um, it, it's important that." He's there for, for people. He says, but his music, musical uh, scope is, you know, about like this, uh, whereas Beethoven's is about as big as the block, you know? <laughs> and I thought that was good. not maybe that, maybe that was an elitist pig attitude or something, but to me it made sense because it, it didn't say Elvis Presley and pop music and there's nothing. It just, it just, it just wasn't the same as this, and this just was a much more complicated universe of, of, of music. And so that kind of stuff um, influenced me tremendously at a very receptive age. Mm -hmm. And after that, my, my teachers were very helpful, in some cases uh, uh, important, but never on that level. He was the first uh, mentor that really influenced me. Um, so I just wanted to give uh, the artist kind of just time to promote anything or share anything that is coming up, and then I'll open up for questions. So do you guys have anything to share? Or anything coming up? Sure. Um, so I have a book binding workshop, and it's going to be this particular style of binding that I mean I kind of invented, although it's nothing uh, no one else has ever done before. But uh, it'll be at Inner Ocean which is in Inglewood, Colorado, on March 18th. Where is uh, Inglewood? Inglewood, it's like South Denver. Oh. So it's actually just south of the San Jose Art District. Inner Ocean is like a new um, paper and book binding center in Denver. Um, actually, Diane, I don't know. But it's, it's another SAIC year at the head. So it's another oh. alumnus of our school. Um, so definitely check them out if you're interested in info finding paper art, letterpress. And inter-ocean. Inter-ocean. Yeah. Well, fantastic. So at this time, I'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, just go ahead and speak clearly. The camera actually picks up the microphone, so if you just talk loudly, it should pick up your questions as well. So does anyone have any questions? How long did you study to tell you about that? Oh, it was it was like a a week, you know. But they have 
most of their classes are a week. I think some are two, and they're intensive. They're every day, eight hours a day, uh, and they do have kind of like a program that you can graduate from. But their focus is more on like fine binding, um, not so much art binding. I was actually the only like artist there. I thought I was a little kooky. Um, but they they focus on like taking a, an already made book block, like say you know your family bible, and finding it in a full leather bespoke binding. So um, great place, learned a lot, but it it is very different from my work. You have a background. You both do apparently in, in installation art, but Kat, specifically to you. You kind of mentioned this. I was looking at your work while you were talking. I was starting to think landscape without digging in. Mm -hmm. But you also talked about the scale being really small, and then you know, landscape is big. And I was like, some of these really almost feel like. I mean, they're sculptural for sure, but they almost feel like little uh, landscapes. And I, I'm trying to get to the question. Uh, the uh, how does scale play into this? I'm looking at the one behind Ronald's shoulder there, and it even from back here it feels like a massive environmental sculpture, mm -hmm. but it's also only maybe four inches, six inches at the widest point. So can you talk a little bit about scale? I guess I mean like you know way back. So when I was young, I remember one of the first video games I ever played was called Myst. I don't know if anyone's played it. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people. So it's like a puzzle game, but it was like beautiful graphics. Um, and the, the main plot of it is like there are people who can write books and they are portals to other universes. So even though it's a small object, it can take you literally to an entire world. And I that like is still in my brain. And it's out, I mean it's also kind of just a metaphor for books, like a book is this little thing, but it can transport you to another world. So I do find the whole scale with them so fascinating. Even when I made installation work, and we were talking before, you know, I didn't have a studio space at my school ever. I've never had a studio separate from my house. So even then I was making big installations, but they were made out of fabric and they would fold out into a little tiny, you know, box that I could carry with me because I had to go on a pebble. So the the scale of big to small, big ideas, little objects or little objects that get really big has been something I've always had to toy with just because of the lack of space and my ability to transport my work, etc. So I do find it really interesting. I think it's there. I'm not you know it's it's not something conscious, but it is definitely like happening. Mm -hmm. That's not only scale, but then you also you just said like you would take it and you put it in a box, you mm -hmm. put it in a container. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really great. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I was wondering how you came up with the idea of sort of fading with your landscapes. You mean the uh, the side things? Yes. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, that's often asked of me, and uh, uh, it, it just uh, happened and developed. Um, I did something like that many years ago uh, when I, I had these sort of transitions between different times, the viewing the landscape, but they were more, more abstract. What do you think they are? Well, it gives a depth, like you're looking through or in. It gives more depth to the painting, which I find very interesting. Uh, does anybody else have any interpretations? This is an interpretation, but because I love the fact that it can be whatever it is. I know what you mean. But I was thinking about you sitting in a car, looking out. It's kind of like the two windows on either side, and you get that little bit of reflection on them. Good, and nobody's ever said that, but oh. that's good. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, I sort of saw that too. So. It also has a hint of, like, to go back to the cell phones thing, when people shoot videos upright, but then they try to post them, the, the things you post them to blur the edges with extra 
data for some reason, and then it forces you to focus in on the center. Mm-hmm. And which is weird because these are the, the long rectangle format that wouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of fun. That yeah, I, I didn't know about that at the time, <clears throat> and uh, I I see I've seen examples of that, and I I thought, well, that's not where it's coming from. So my more recent work. Uh, has blurred edges. They, these lines aren't there. Mm. The thing just sort of fades out into white. And uh, actually, I like that better. Um, but that's it's just a, you know a development, uh, a step along the process. Um, a lot, lot of people have come up with all sorts of uh, interesting interpretations, and I think that's good. Um, uh, I had some idea about. Where you know after I did it, I, I, I began thinking about it, and I came over my interpretations. But I don't think they're any better than anybody else's. You know? They're just what I what I thought about. So it's even as like peripheral, right? And too, when you talk about memory, it's sort of interesting in terms of what you're looking at, and then too in terms of. Um, the periphery being like past and future or mm-hmm. other aspects of yes. that space like, outside of what you're experiencing in that moment. Yeah. <coughs> that, that, that's another thing that nobody's mm-hmm. ever come up with yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I'm interested, uh, you said that it's not so important to you to impose your uh, meaning of your work to the audience. My ex-husband used to always ask, but what does it mean? Uh-huh. And it used to make me so angry. Because <laughs> he could figure out quite well what it meant to him. Um, I mean, I'm an artist and I've uh, worked for many, many years. But I, uh, I, what I, uh, I moved out to Colorado and I had the sense of being able to bring it out here. I had lived for many, many years in Washington, D.C., where what you saw was uh, a wall of houses or a bush or a tree, but there was no sense of anywhere your eye could rest. But you convey that so beautifully. And yet, in, in, uh, you know, you talk about the large landscape here. Uh, it's an unending landscape, but there are other places. I grew up in Norway where uh, landscape is small, intimate rooms, because you don't have the opportunity, unless you climb up a mountain, to see anywhere beyond that. But still, in this picture, I have a sense of immense space, although it's a very small, intimate space. Mm -hmm. And it reads like that, but it also reads as having an enormous amount of space in it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's... uh that's true. That's one of the big impressions I got out here. Uh, whereas where I lived previously in you know, southeastern Ohio in Appalachia, these little valleys, uh, you can't really see out of them. You can't really see dawn or sunset um, unless you get to the top. And then usually there are trees up there that you can't see past either. So it's a very intimate, kind of spooky yeah. space. Whereas here, it's this vast. Yeah. We don't have elves and gnomes out here. You have them in Appalachia. That's yeah, right, Appalachia. There were there were definitely gnomes <laughs> <laughs> under every rock, but yeah. uh, not out here. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering after uh, leaving a more formal education setting, um, you know, where you're uh, critiquing your own work and others' work uh, pretty often. Uh, do you get together with any artists and critique each other's works after leaving that public setting? Uh, I'm, I'm lucky. I have a very good critic that I married to, who <laughs> <laughs> is a very good painter himself and gives me uh, gives me a hard time whenever I, I need it. Uh, other, other than that, uh, uh, I have had ex- 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 exhibitions here. And um, usually there's some kind of public involvement there, so I do get some feedback that way. But it's not it's not the same as in a, a tight academic community. Um, in in Athens, Ohio, at Ohio University, um, 
It's, it's a rather isolated place. I mean, yeah. You're within a day's drive of New York and Chicago, but it's a day's drive. And Columbus is an hour away. And so you, you tend to be uh, insular in your connections. But that created a very strong uh, uh, sense of community and exchange of ideas and intensity. Uh, I mean, Jim Dine graduated from there. And uh, um, um, the other famous artist, uh, Ginny Holzer. Mm -hmm. She was actually in my painting class. Oh, wow. uh, so we, 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 there have been a lot of other artists that have come out of there that are self-supporting and working internationally. And have, so it was a very intense um, little compressed area there that really, I think, uh, was beneficial in that sense. So after after all that left, I, I, uh, I still carry that with me, I guess. But, you know, yeah. But I think uh, 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 critiquing people's this and that, we can be mad and and not really give you much to give you a sense of, uh, of actual feedback. Or it can be so rough that it can make you stop whatever you are doing. Mm -hmm. I lived in Washington for many years and exhibited and so on. Um, so I had both. Um, my daughter, who went to Risky, once gave me a Risky School review and critique of my work. And man, that was rough. <laughs> of course, she was also my daughter and a very good artist, too. So, um, uh, Critique, you critique, you, uh, it, it isn't that one has to be afraid of anything, but you do also have to choose where you're going to get critique that serves you, that mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. is critical, but critical, but with a good attitude. How about you? So, my work is so out there. It is sometimes a little bit more difficult. I did take a critique class. That was um, spearheaded, moderated by Richard Minsky, who is a very famous book artist. He um, started the Center for the Book in New York City, and because of that, there's now centers for the books in lots of different places. But you know, the a big part of the book art critique space is that um, it's kind of a very new sort of art form, and it's very wishy-washy. There are people who make books that are entirely blank and they're just a beautiful outside, there's something inside of them, they're decorative. There's people who make books where the content of the book is not theirs. They have just made the cover for the book. So there's such a massive amount of book art, what's book art, what's an artist's book. Um, and then the language that we should use in order to catalog our books because most artist books end up in artist book collections. They're put in yet another box put on a shelf and never pulled out again because the librarian doesn't remember where it is because we don't have a good set of language for cataloging these books. So I guess that long, big roundabout thing was I find it very difficult to kind of have critique of my work because most people are just like, what? Um, I am hoping that at InterOcean we can kind of come up with some sort of critique because you know, there's a lot of paper artists there at least, so they're kind of like tangentially related. But I will say it's tough to price my work, it's tough to show, know where to show my work, and it's tough to um, get critiques on it. But, you know, always welcome. This is a question I have that's really been to statements, it's also another question. <laughs> but, I mean, I guess too, like if you frame it as like it's book art, mm -hmm. then maybe that could be a difficult journey for you, but if you see it as sculpture, I see it, I'm a sculptor, and so mm -hmm. I feel like I'm seeing a lot, I'm relating to a lot of what you do in terms of, my first question is, um, when you choose the books, is it just like hardcover book, uh, is there any relationship to the content, and the term form, or is it all that the content just sort of doesn't matter because it's all sort of getting put in a blender and spit out as an aesthetic form, right, and then you're sort of like, the the choosing of the objects is an intuitive process, right, like, 
what goes with what and how does it fit and what colors are running and what shape does this take. Um, and, and it relates to a lot of the work that I did in grad school. But it, so that's kind of where this next I guess, statement's coming from, that it's almost like you're intuitively crafting this sort of creative, open-ended, write-your-own-adventure narrative for the viewer <laughs> as they explore it. So, yeah, to answer your question, the content is typically the source of dictionaries, translations, um, things that have to do specifically with language and what a word means. And I think it's funny that we have these static translations. This word means this. This word means this. This word is the same as this word. When we all know that language is, is always evolving and changing. Um, so I find the static nature of that super fascinating. So I do books relate to that. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in anthropology and linguistics as right. well, um, but also I, I like that they're non-narrative, so it doesn't matter that I've taken it apart and put it back together. Right. Yeah. But the books, are they books about that, or are they just books as symbols that represent that idea? I'm ex I am going to, I think it, I had to pick something to go in there, mm -hmm. and I wanted to reuse something that wouldn't be used otherwise Right, use a thesaurus anymore. Yeah. So it was an environmental concern that led me kind of down this path, um, as opposed to using blank pages. Right. Um, so it's kind of like there had to be something. So I went with that because I felt like it was related. I am going to experiment with paper making soon, where I use the scraps left over because there is cutoffs from those books, and oddly enough, put it in a blender and make some paper out of it. Uh, so, and then you won't be able to read them at all. Yeah, I guess I like the idea of reusing too, because yeah. all the objects that you find, those are repurposed mm -hmm. also. Yeah. And um, also the scale I really like, because I've also worked really small, but I like that it's kind of a conversation with one person at a time. It's like a little whispering conversation instead of a, a big piece that maybe 10 or 20 people can look at at once. It's kind of, you have to wait for your turn, and then, <laughs> and then you're like, it's just you, and everyone else is like, hurry, and you're like, ha ha ha, no, it's mine alone. Um, so I, I like that relationship with our as well. Well, we are at 2.15, so um, we are going to end the talk here, and then just give you a chance to walk around and kind of talk with the artists about specific works uh, that maybe came up during the talk. I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for coming, and thank you to our artists for coming and talking with us and sharing a bit about your process your background. Um, so thank you so much for coming and um, just hope to see you in the gallery again too. Thank you.